Good afternoon, everybody. Um, today, um, Alex and me are gonna present uh, distributed deep, deep learning on Mesos um, with GPU and GAN scheduling. Um, this is a project uh, we uh, delivered at uh, Uber uh, with, uh, two, with a collaboration between compute team as well as the Michelangelo team. So we have, uh, uh, my name is Ming Kai. Um, this is Alex, and we have uh, Anne Holler there too. Uh, then also Paul, uh, Paul Maxo. So, um, first of all, let's talk about why we need, uh, oh, Alex, you want to introduce yourself first? Um, I'm Alex, I'm from Deep Learning team, and then Min is from Compute Platform team. So um, first, uh, let's talk about like why we need a deep learning at Uber. So uh, as all you guys probably know, uh, Uber has grown very fast in the last few years uh, from uh, initially a ride sharing company. Now we have our self-driving uh, uh, business unit. Um, so basically self-driving cars are a, a huge uh, source of workload for especially for uh, deep learning and uh, um, machine learnings. Then next use case is of course as a ride sharing company we would like to predict what is the trip and how much trip we're going to see in the next coming months or year. And then third one is uh, because Uber is completely based on uh, mobile payment and of course, people are gonna take advantage of that and make some money out of, the, out of Uber's uh, success. So first, for the self-driving vehicles, uh, right now we have both self-driving cars as well as self-driving trucks. And the self-driving vehicle problem is actually very interesting, as you guys probably already know. It's largely uh, computer vision as well as uh, um, image recognition and uh, basically perception issues, as well as like how do you build a, uh, precise 3D maps. So all those need a lot of like deep learning um, computation in Nepal, as well as like how you train those distribute, uh, deep learning models uh, quick enough so we can do quick turnarounds. Then for the trip forecasting, uh, as we see here, this is actually, we have an engineering blog talking about how we do uh, chip forecasting using di uh, deep learning networks um, based on lots of time series data as well as other information, potentially like weather information, events, for example, the Super Bowl coming, all those things. So uh, as we can see here, um, you know, deep learning is very powerful actually. The, the, the prediction is uh, pretty accurate. That gave us lots of um, nice um, advantage or um, nice uh, lead time to notify drivers, say, hey, there's lots of uh, um, trip demand coming. Do you want to uh, turn on your app and then start like driving for Uber? Then the third, uh, third use case is uh, fault detection. Um, so this is, for example, one a typical use case for how people can cash out some money from Uber, especially to, like in early days, Uber has lots of incentives uh, or re uh, referral code, and basically uh, some first just go to spam referral code to their friends and then uh, partner up with friends as the driver, and then cash out Uber credits. So. This is, is, is actually a huge problem when we have the China business because people just like do lots of those. <laughs> so deep learning is actually an, a very good um, approach to basically use different signals to figure out who might be a potential uh, protest. So now let's talk about why distributed deep learning, right? So as you guys probably know, um, the, the success of recent deep learning is because of two things. One is uh, big data, so we have lots of lots of data, and potentially, hopefully, labeled data. Uh, the second part is you have a huge cluster, 
as well as uh, the, GP, the advance of the GPUs. So basically, you just have like lots of computational pores with uh, lots of data. Uh, that's actually a, uh, is kind of the main con uh, contribution of uh, underneath the reason why the distributed deep learning or, or deep learning itself become a, a success in the recent uh, years. So for distributed deep learning is critical for that uh, for three reasons. One is you want to speed up model training because some large uh, deep learning models would take like weeks or months to train um, with huge amount of data. With distributed deep learning, you can basically uh, speed up that significantly. And of course, you can scale out to hundreds of uh, GPUs. The third reason is some large deep learning models, they cannot really fit into a single machine. So with distributed deep learning, you can basically partition those uh, models and then um, uh, doing training as well as uh, prediction for that. So this diagram shows how distributed deep learning works in general. This is like a very high level. Uh, so the idea is you have lots of data on your data store, which is, it could be HDFS or any other like uh, file system. And then you have different training process, which is normally running in containers. And they will um, retrieve data, uh, basically they will ingest data from data store. And then we have you know, data scientists or, or deep learning um, uh, experts will come up with the deep learning models with different layers and parami uh, initial parameters. And those models will be in uh, each training process. And then uh, each training process will compute um, the model updates, which are the uh, gradients. So th this, this step is uh, kind of parallel or independent of each other. However, after the model um, updates, all those training process need to talk to each other and then compute the averaged gradients. So that's the key, uh, actually one very unique property of this kind of uh, workload because it's not like a, a, a Spark or a MapReduce or streaming process. You know, those different processes don't necessarily need to communicate to each other. So this is kind of very tightly coupled uh, a distributed application. And one kind of similar application is like a traditional MPI kind of uh, applications in supercomputing world. So this has lots of kind of unique challenges um, to how to sort, uh, make this uh, work efficiently at uh, um, like a cluster management system like Mesos. So first, we're gonna talk about why we choose Mesos. Uh, of course, because this is Mesos Kong, so <laughs> uh, that's the reason we are here. Um, but be beyond that, the reason we decided to use Mesos is first, it's widely adopted. Like as we know, like lots of big companies, Apple, Netflix, um, over uh, Twitter is using uh, Mesos in production for quite a long time. And uh, also, Mesos has a very good GPU support. Uh, uh, especially with the latest uh, uh, NVIDIA um, isolators, everything, so that uh, is kind of perfect for this use case. The third one is with the newly introduced nested containers, which enables us to do lots of uh, things, for example, like separate the management code from uh, user's own Docker image. So basically, we, uh, that, that provides us lots of good isolations between the machine learning platform and the uh, user uh, Docker image. Uh, of course, Mesos is highly customizable and reliable and scalable. So that's the, the key reasons we use Mesos. So uh, I'm not sure how many of you guys already run uh, GPUs on Mesos. So anybody raise your hand? Cool, so we have like actually pretty good, uh, so, how many of you are using uh, Mesos Containerizer or Unified Containerizer instead of uh, Docker Containerizer? Good, good. So uh, as you guys probably already know, uh, you know, Mesos has this nice APIs for Containerizer as well as APIs for Isolator. Uh, actually, for us, we also use a uh, Unified Mesos Containerizer because that's the only thing works upstream right now. Uh, for Docker Containerizer, you have to 
take some upstream patch and uh, you know uh, deal with that yourself. But uh, the, the key part here is NVIDIA actually uh, contributed their GPU allocator as well as uh, uh, isolator. So basically you can pretty much from the Mesos framework perspective, we can manage the GPU resource almost the same as other like CPU or memory resource. Uh, then of course you have to prepare your Mesos agent with the co uh, correct G uh, uh, NVIDIA driver uh, as well as like, for example, in the Docker image, you have to have the correct like CUDA versions, everything. So those are the kind of the, you know, GPU's a little bit tricky from that aspect. Now, the second one I would like to discuss a little bit is uh, 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 Mesos nested container. So just want to get some idea, like how many of you guys are using nested containers? Okay, that's much less people, <laughs> but this is a great feature, right? So basically, the idea for nested container is you want, for example, like let's say we build some general machine learning platform, which of course will have some um, control uh, um, code inside of the container, but that control code uh, needs to be kind of separate or uh, decoupled away from the user Docker image, because in the machine learning or deep learning space, uh, different teams or different like uh, data scientists, they want like different toolings in their uh, Docker image. For example, they want install um, some different Python uh, libraries. Those will, those will you know, have like issues if you put them in the same Docker image. So with nested container, basically what we are doing is we have a, a parent task which is running the management code, and then, 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 then the management code will, oops, the management code will then go back to Mesos agent and to pull the nested containers, which is a different image, and running that way. And then basically for, for us, for example, we have TensorFlows, um, the model or the trainings is in the uh, nested container. So yeah, Mesos is cool, but the question is what is missing? Um, so there are a few key items like to, uh, we need to kind of, um, build ourselves on top of Mesos so we can make this a production ready. The first thing or most important one is uh, we call it elastic GPU resource uh, management. Because GPU is kind of a resource which is very expensive. You know, as you guys probably know, like the enterprise grade GPU is like five grand, one piece. And you put like four of them in one machine, that's like tw uh, 20 grand right there. <laughs> and plus the power support, and rack, everything. So GPU is very, very expensive. Uh, of course, you don't really want the GPU resource to sit, sit there idle. Um, so that's why, like, but, you know, we have, like, at least at Uber, we have different organizations. Um, they all want, like, use GPU, but you, you cannot really give them a static quota, because if you give them a static quota, if they're not using it, then your GPU is sit idle. The second part is, as we, we talked about it before, because of the uh, averaging uh, gradients computation, uh, we need lots of uh, network bandwidth between different uh, um, workers to communicate to each other so they can compute the, uh, the final model. So this will, uh, this will need us to support the locality and the network aware placement. The idea is like you would like to place all the uh, containers of the same training job as close to each other as possible. Then uh, the next one is the GAN scheduling, because uh, typically in the distributed deep learning training job, you will need all the workers to be up so you can make progress together. So that means like if you only allocate half of the workers, or you only allocate a resource for half of the workers, then they will have to stay uh, um, idle there and wait for the remaining resource. So this will easily introduce a deadlock situation. For example, if you only have like 10 GPU and then each job need eight GPU, then if you don't have any way to kind of do GAN scheduling of those uh, eight uh, GPU workers, then they, they will put like each grab like five and then waiting there. Um, also, like for task discovery, because this is a distributed, distributed training application, they need to know each other's uh, 
uh, I, like which machine they are running on and which dynamic ports they are listening on the um, uh, connection. So this, we have to solve that the dis uh, discovery problem. Uh, but that discovery is a little bit different than the service discovery uh, you know, we have talked about last, uh, yesterday, uh, because this discovery is only within uh, the same job scope. Finally, of course, we have to handle the uh, failure, fail, uh, failures. So this, this is like how, uh, to address these issues, uh, we actually um, implement a system called uh, a Peloton, uh, which is a cluster of bicycles. The idea of the name, that name is, you know, if you cluster together, you move faster together. Um, so basically, you know, as we can see here, um, Peloton is trying to bridge the gap between a more general purpose scheduler and then Mesos, because Mesos provide lots of great uh, task execution, resource allocation as well. But then we're still missing the preemption aspect, uh, the, the placement, and finally the job and task life cycle. So the Peloton is trying to be a scheduler which uh, will provide a common implementation for all those things. And of course, it try to, it's gonna support a GPU as well as a mixed workloads. So this is a high level architecture of Peloton. Uh, it's basically set on top of Mesos Master, and we are using uh, HTT, uh, the latest uh, Mesos HTT API. And then itself has its own uh, API exposed in uh, protocol buff. And uh, right now we, we have our own homegrown G, uh, RPC uh, implementation, but it's 100% backwards compatible with any gRPC client. So that's actually gave, a, gave us a very good uh, like, uh, flexibility. For example, our UI is in Node.js, uh, we have uh, like Python client, Java client, uh, which can all talk to the backend using the same uh, protocol. Then the Peloton itself actually has break it down into like four big components. One is the host manager, which kind of aggregate all the resource from Mesos and present that to a resource manager. Uh, the resource manager itself basically will do this elastic resource sharing. And then we implement different uh, flavor of placement engines, uh, one of them is kind of for deep learning, so which kind of supports uh, locality, lo uh, which will support actually locality where, uh, where. Uh, right now it's more like constraint based. And also, uh, uh, then for the job manager, we will do uh, basically manage the life cycle of the uh, job and tasks. And all those data, uh, all, lots, all those metadata like a jobs configuration or task configuration as well as the runtime, uh, saved in Cassandra, so you can basically uh, do lots of like uh, search and index on that. Uh, so uh, this this slide shows like how we uh, what's our solution for the Elastic GPU um, resource management. Uh, the idea is basically we take this very similar idea as what Mesos is also doing right now, but, but we kind of we cannot wait, so we did that in our uh, schedule itself to begin with. Um, once Mesos is available, we can basically offload that to Mesos. Uh, but the, anyway, the high, high level idea is we have something called a reservation, which every organization can say how much uh, GPU I want to reserve. Uh, but if they don't use, those resources will be used for other uh, uh, organizations as a, uh, as a like, um, best effort or fair share resource. And then we have job priorities, which is local to, uh, local to individual um, organization. And we, we have a concept called the resource pool, which is very similar to the uh, raw concept in Mesos. So basically, for uh, this is a hierarchical resource pool, and you can define the, what's the reserved resource for this pool, and what's the fair share uh, if for those uh, idle resources. And then, dynamically, we can compute what's the current resource, this resource pool is entitled to run. So then for GAN scheduling, um, basically we um, solve this problem uh, in this, also in the Peloton scheduler layer uh, by define a subset of tasks in a job uh, which was uh, basically scheduled, uh, basically it, all the GAN tasks will be a single scheduling unit. That means it will be admitted, uh, placed, uh, preempted, and killed as a group. And, but the, those GAN tasks, though, is an independent execution unit. 
because they are running in separate containers and may fail independently. So that actually requires us to do lots of life cycle management on the GAN side, because if some task cannot be restarted, we have to kill the whole GAN. So finally, uh, then the next uh, uh, interesting problem is like, you know, we have to implement some uh, special uh, placement strategies for this particular use case. Um, one is like we would like to place as many as containers of the same job into the same host or rack, so we can minimize the uh, network traffic uh, across rack, top of rack switch. And uh, also we would like to use some kind of best fit algorithm instead of wide spreading uh, algorithm to tightly pack GPU containers. Uh, finally, we have to support uh, constraint-based placement so that the user can place all the, uh, um, for all the containers of the same job using the same generation of GPU. So this is actually also very important because unlike CPU, uh, different generation of GPU has huge difference in terms of performance. So we don't really want to mix uh, different GPU models in the same job. Now I'm gonna give, uh, give to Alex to talk about how TensorFlow and how the performance number look like on top of uh, Mesos. Thanks, man. All right, so um, as we grew as a company, as we did more and more of machine learning, we realized that we need to invest in our deep learning infrastructure and the framework we chose for majority of our model is TensorFlow. So why did we do that? Uh, TensorFlow is the most popular open source framework for deep learning at this moment. Uh, when I was preparing these slides, I looked at the GitHub page and it's basically showing 69,000 stars and 34,000 forks. It's huge number by the, um, compared to other frameworks. Uh, so that, as users, give us ability to ramp up people much easier because there is a lot more examples for how to use TensorFlow, how to deploy it, and all that stuff. Um, TensorFlow also combines high performance with ability to tinker with low-level model details. So what that means is you can take some of the high-level abstractions and they work very well. At the same time, if you want to write your own implementation for some new operation that you came up with, you can do it in CUDA code and you can integrate it with TensorFlow without any issues. They have nice plugin model for that. And then TensorFlow has end-to-end -end support from research to production. So you can do research really easy because of that and you can also export your model and then deploy it all within the same framework. So, Min mentioned about how we do distributed deep learning. So in general, you have, basically you have MapReduce, except MapReduce whole phase happens every second. And your model weights are about one or multiple gigabytes. So every second you exchange multiple gigabytes that every worker possesses, and they all need to arrive to average number. So how does distributed TensorFlow handle that? There is typically one of the two patterns. Either you have one parameter server, which is a special kind of worker, and all the workers communicate with that parameter server to upload those weights. Another option that people do is, instead of having one parameter server, you can have multiple, or in extreme case, you have same amount of parameter servers as workers. So what that gives is, it allows you to offload the load from the single parameter server, so you don't have a bottleneck anymore, but at the same time, that gives you basically all-to-all -all communication pattern, that every host has to communicate with every other host, which is also not ideal. Um, but it works, so when we deployed a traditional distributed TensorFlow on the Mesos, that's how we did it. Basically, at Uber, we have this Michelangelo deep learning platform or service, which talks to Peloton, and then Peloton schedules our distributed uh, TensorFlow jobs on uh, Mesos agents. So we get containers provisioned with our management code, and then we start nested containers with user code, which may use variety of versions of TensorFlow and may use variety of like native libraries or whatever, which could conflict with our management container otherwise. Um, so typically what happens is in case of the first pattern, you would have one parameter server, and then on every host, you would typically have one container with one worker container. And then those containers would use as many GPUs as possible within the same, uh, same container instance. So we deployed that, um, and then this is, we did the benchmark. So we tried standard TensorFlow benchmark, which is very popular now, and this is the numbers that we get. 
it's actually a pretty good number. So we are able to train image model and ImageNet data set, which is about a little over one million images. We're able to train it in three or four minutes because processing rate is 5,000 images per second. So that's pretty good. But is it best we can do? So if we look at scaling factor, which is basically a number of uh, images per second you get on many GPUs compared to one GPU, this is what we get. We see that for different networks, numbers are different, but ma major team is that we lose 50% of your com our compute resource. So on ResNet, which is one of the popular networks, we get 31 GPU, basically 31X on 64 GPUs, and then on Inception we get 35. These are two very popular models. Um, how can we do better? So what's, what's wrong with this model? Uh, we can do two things. First, we can change communication algorithm. So instead of doing all to all or all to one, maybe we can do something else. Second, we can try to use um, different kind of networking because we exchange gigabytes of data every second. Maybe we can offload doing so from the CPU to NICs themselves. Okay. Um, so we invested in this and we came up with a framework to do that called Horvat. So what does Horvat do? Horvat is a distributed training framework for TensorFlow. Uh, it uses different algorithms. It uses bandwidth op optimal algorithm to do this exchange of gradients, which I will dive deep in. Uh, it uses Rocky or InfiniBand if it's available, or otherwise it can also work on plain TCP. And then it installs on top of TensorFlow just do using Python package installation. So as a benefit, you don't rebuild the whole TensorFlow, which takes uh, like a half an hour and experience of doing so. You can just do pip install and it installs in a few seconds. So how does it work? It's using very different methods than your regular parameter server. So what happens is it's using so-called ring all reduce, which is something that was coming from the um, HPC world, high performance computer world, where they do MPI, they do weather predictions, these kind of things. Uh, and there is a paper which is showing that this is most optimal algorithm. And the high level idea is this. Let's say you have three workers, each of them have some amount of numbers. So they uh, split their arrays of numbers into the same amount as how there is workers. So in this example, three. Uh, and then they do, they send each other um, those numbers and they add the numbers together. So in this case, worker, first worker will send its first uh, chunk to the second worker, second worker will send second chunk to third worker, and so on and so forth. So they have to do this operation same amount of times as there is workers, minus one. And what happens is at, during that time, they only, each worker only communicates with two adjacent workers, which is good because it saves your bandwidth, you don't have this all-to-all -all communication pattern, so your network switches are pretty happy. Uh, at the same time, what happens next is after you do these n minus one iterations, you will have correct answer for every chunk, but it will be scattered across all the workers. So what you do is you just send the data around in the similar circular pattern, and then after another n minus one iterations, everybody will have the right answer. So this algorithm, it's, uh, as I said, more optimal, and it's uh, only talking to two peers. So how do we run this on Mesos? This is very different, right? So uh, we leverage MPI to provide us with infrastructure to kick off all the jobs and make them aware of each other. And we use uh, NVIDIA library called Nickel to actually do all reduce on GPUs. So the way we deploy this is we provision one container on one server and that container, regardless of how many GPUs, and that container will launch n copies of the training script, uh, where n is number of GPUs you have. So in this case, you have two GPUs per server, so it launches two processes. So what it gives you is that you write your code as a single GPU code, and MPI will launch n number of pr copies per container. So yeah, in this case, uh, we have MPI here, uh, and we use SSH as a communication agent. So when MPI launches the script, it will use SSH to just launch the program on every host. Um, so how does this compare performance-wise? 
we see that, so these are numbers where we see both distributed transfer flow and Harvard. Uh, we see the numbers are much better. So with Harvard, we get almost 8,000 images per second, and that means that for the same image net, we can do one epoch in about two minutes. And then we see that scaling factors are actually very good. We see that uh, we get about 33x on Inception V3, and we get about 57x on ResNet 101. Um, so, and these numbers were obtained on TCP network. We strongly believe that on Rocky capable network, we would get even better numbers, but at the time of doing this test, we didn't have correct setup. Uh, so, that's all cool, right? Sounds good. What about developer usability? Are developers gonna be happy to use this? Uh, not everybody cares about squeezing every inch of performance, they just wanna train their model faster. So what we found is uh, this approach of doing development of single GPU TensorFlow script and then having it distribute actually is much easier than standard TensorFlow. So in this slide, there is an example of distributed TensorFlow script from the Google website and it doesn't fit, you cannot read anything because it's a it's pretty long example. And the problem with that is there is a lot of concepts that with distributed TensorFlow you have to learn. You have to create so-called towers, average gradients among them within the worker, then you have to create these parameter servers, workers, and the problem is all this code bleeds into your model and you have to insert different portions of the code in different places. So with Harvard, user experience is arguably much better because, uh, so this is the equivalent program, but in Horvath. And basically the highlighted bold parts are the things that you need to add to make your single GPU program distributed. And you, there is basically four major components. And one of them you need to initialize it, another is you need to tell it which GPU it's gonna use, which is gonna be same as program original number in your container. Then you wrap your optimizer that you use with distributed optimizer, which is gonna take care of collecting the gradients and then averaging them. And then the last part is to do um, initialization when everybody does an initialization. Let's make sure that, makes sure that all of them start initialization with the same values. So that, uh, we did internally a lot of uh, deployment with this model and we found that users are much, much more happy to embrace this model rather than convert their program to standard distributed TensorFlow. And then the best part is this Horvath is available today on the GitHub. If you or your teams or your companies are doing deep learning, you may find it useful. So we're super welcome for you to use it, leave us feedback if you find usability, some any issues or any installation problems or anything, give us a shout. If you do bench, performance benchmark, we're super, we're super interested what numbers you're gonna get and we are willing to help you to get the best numbers. So thank you, do you have any questions? So, so you were asking, do we have a training and whether we have information about how the full data set runs? Or? Yes, so we did apply this to actual deep learning problems that we have. In, we, I can give you one example. We had models which used to train two weeks and we made it train in seven hours. So Facebook actually recently published a paper how to train ImageNet on ResNet 101 on ImageNet in one hour on 256 GPUs, and they're using exactly the same approach, but they use CAFE 2. So if you use CAFE 2, you can uh, use Facebook approach. Uh, if you use TensorFlow, you can use this. Uh, no, if you use, so this is actually a very interesting question. When you scale distributed training, uh, what happens is your, you effectively increase how many examples per second or per batch you process. So when you do, let's say you 
have single GPU training, you look at 64 examples, you compute model update based on 64 examples, and you basically adjust your model to that. If you go to super large batch, instead of doing these small updates, you kind of do bigger update. And the tricky part with that is the space of the model is not convex, so you may fall into some trap. So if you have huge set that you process per one step, then it's easier for you to fall into most local trap. Facebook introduced this approach of changing learning rate as you scale, and they demonstrated scaling on 256 GPUs. So what they recommend doing is, uh, you basically need to increase your learning rate, but don't start with the learning rate which is equivalent to your original learning rate multiplied by number of GPUs because that's introduced too much jitter. So what they did is they scaled their learning rate during first N epoch, which is hyperparameter which you need to tweak, and then you do your normal redu reduction of learning rate. This is though open area for research. We found that they found that it doesn't scale more than 8,000 images, or 8,000 examples per batch. So there is definitely limit how much you can go higher. And it's actually a very active area of research. How can you go higher? If you have thousands of GPUs, how do you train? And it's, I think next paper about that is, should be coming from somebody. Mm -hmm. So MPI doesn't have great handle of failure recovery. It basically crashes everything. So what we do is we ensure that users do checkpoints on a fairly regular basis, and then we just recover from last checkpoint. Uh, on, in practice, we found that we seldom see errors in flight, assuming all the hardware is okay. And also, like in the Peloton layer, we're building like automatic retries. Of course, you can see this is a batch job, so you can see what's the maximum number of retries you want to do, so we do that automatically as well. Any more questions? Last chance? All right, thank you. Thank you.